We're live. Hi, I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I am honored, so honored, to be moderating a forum called Bridging the Digital Divide Town Hall. We are sponsored by Columbia University School of Social Work, the West Harlem Development Corporation, which is helping to get tablets to those in West Harlem who need them, and certainly by Community Board Number 11, by Beta NYC, and by Silicon Harlem. And this is a really wonderful time to be discussing all of the issues that determine what digital divide is because uh, as some of you know, I spent a lot of time in the city council and as borough president looking at data and digital divide, but I don't think anything prepared us as I'm sure you'll hear for the need for technology uh, given this horrible coronavirus situation. And um, that's what we're gonna talk about. Apropos, I hope there's no silver lining when so many people have died, friends, family, and so on. But if there is a tiny, tiny bit, it is those of us on this panel and all of you feel the same way. We've been talking about it for years, the need to make sure that technology is available to everybody. And some of us have been saying this for a very long time. Our first, death, death, our first guest is really, really special, Dr. Desmond Patton. He's an associate professor of social work at the Columbia School of Social Work. And we do love that school because it's in East Harlem. And I'm sure the chair of the community board will tell you that. He's the founding director of Safe Lab. He's a member of the Data Science Institute and a faculty affiliate of the Social Intervention Group. And he has a courtesy appointment in the Department of Sociology. His research is qualitative, it's data related, and he studies the relationship as part of his uh, research between youth and gang violence and social media, how and why violence, grief, identity are expressed on social media, mm -hmm. and the real world impact these expressions have on the well-being for low-income youth of color. He studies the ways in which gang-involved youth conceptualize threats on social media and the extent to which social media shapes and facilitates youth and gang violence. He has been uh, cited and featured in his research in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, US Today, NPR, and many, many, many other publications. Before coming to Columbia, he was an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. He holds a BA in Anthropology and Political Science from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and the MSW from the University of Michigan School of Social Work and a PhD in Social Service Administration from the University of Chicago. Dr. Patton, thank you very much. We're all honored that you're on our panel and we look forward to hearing from you about this very major issue and your perspective, digital divide. Thank you. Dr. Patton. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful to be with you all uh, this evening. Again, my name is Desmond Patton. Um, I'm an associate professor of uh, social work, sociology and data science at at the Columbia School of Social Work. Um, I spend a lot of time with young people in New York City, really trying to understand how they make sense of uh, uh, violence um, and loss and grief on social media, uh, leveraging artificial intelligence to uh, automatically identify these issues online. Um, but I'm particularly concerned um, about um, what's uh, their, how their life is impacted by the virus and their access to technology or the lack thereof. And in particular, um, one of the things that I've been really chewing on is reconceptualizing how we think about the digital divide. And I'm gonna put an idea out there that I hope we can think about. Um, what if we reimagine the digital divide as a public health issue? This is a concept and idea that my colleague F. Allen Wilson has been putting forth and really thinking about um, access to technology, leveraging technology as a critical lifeline to services and needs. And when that lifeline is disrupted, how might it impact um, young people, in particular young people who are ethnic and racial minorities, but are also the same students whose uh, parents are essential workers, um, who may have lost their jobs, who may be um, underemployed or unemployed because of the virus, who may lack access to healthcare and other needs as well. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation and looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. Our next panel is my friend Nilsa Orama. She is chair of Community Board 11. She has chaired the 2015 Nominating Committee. She's a former vice chair of the Housing Bylaws and Youth and Education Committee. And she's been on the Parks Committee. And she also had a lot to do with the East Harlem Rezoning Task Force. I was on that task force. That was a lot of work. She's a lifelong resident of East Harlem. She has served as a parent volunteer in many schools in the district, as well as in the Ice Hockey in Harlem program. She has been participating in CERT, which is the Community Emergency Response Training, an organization that I feel very strongly about. Um, it's under the Office of Emergency Management, which is quite busy these days. She's the director in terms of her job, a real job, as opposed to just the community board, which is another full-time job. She's director of the East Harlem Multi-Service Center. It's an HRA multi-service center and it provides office space for 12 not-for-profits in East Harlem. She's also the president of the East Harlem El Barrio Land Trust, where she has been uh, the board secretary for quite some time. And she um, has worked as a job developer for the East Harlem Council for Community Improvement, which is an adult training program and she has held the position of director of youth services, and she has spent a great deal of time focused on youth development. Um, she holds a master of business administration and she's a licensed notary public. I just know her as one terrific community board chair. Nilsa, go ahead. Thank you, Gail, right back at you. Um, so as she said, as um, our great Manhattan Bill President stated. My name is Nosa Raman. I'm the chair of Manhattan Community Board 11. I've been living in East Harlem for a, a, a total number of years. Um, and I want to thank Gail. I want to thank Columbia University, all the sponsors who have collaborated on this event. I am honored to be on a panel with Desmond and Clayton and Noel. I am the lay person of the group. I can't speak to the specialties that everyone will speak to in terms of technology, but I can bring a regular personal perspective um, to this conversation um, because I know what it's like not to have computer skills and have to um, sign up in a not-for-profit to learn computer skills and to then try to compete with those out there who have um, more uh, marketable skills than I did and learn how to sell myself because it's not easy when you come from a certain community where you're black and brown and you may not have the polish that people are looking for to get your foot in the door. And so that's what drove me to work with the Summer Youth Employment Program for close to 14 years so that I can help shape through my experiences what others would be going through because our communities are only going to grow and thrive through the youth and through the people within our communities. We know that our immigrant communities don't get all the support. A lot of our kids, we have that digital divide that I'm sure we're gonna talk about, which not, it's not only technology, it's money, it's a whole bunch of different things that separate our communities and do not allow our youth or our um, community members to think that they can compete. So I am very happy to be here the COVID-19 has decimated our community, but I think it gives us an opportunity to learn and to plan so that the next time we will be in a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So No Hildago is executive director of Beta NYC. Um, he works at the crossroads of technology and government and community impact. He believes in participatory communities and uses technology to improve people's lives. That is true. Since 2009, he has organized Beta NYC to be a driving force to improve our city's use of technology and share its data. I think you know that I passed the open data bill and I so appreciate Beta NYC taking this bill and going miles, miles than I ever could have imagined in terms of sharing it with communities. Beta NYC has advocated for a suite of government transparency laws, including the city's transformative open data law and city record online law. Beta NYC runs New York City's Civic Innovation Lab Fellows Program with the Office of the Manhattan Borough President and it curates the New York City School of Data Community Conference. It's a wonderful conference every year, hugely attended. 
He was an Eagle Scout. I did not write that part. He was a Technology and Democracy Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. He served as an inaugural member of Code for America's National Advisory Council and is a former fellow currently an affiliate of Data and Society Research Institution. And he's a very special guy. Noel, go ahead. Thanks, Gail. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so one of the things that we focus on within the digital divide is uh, the access to information part. Um, we're so fortunate to be able to work with Gail on a regular basis, uh, who is the fairy godmother of civic technology and open data in New York, um, because we can address problems uh, that are hard to see. Um, we like to think back to the days of um, when the the whole notion of epidemiology just was created. Um, and so here we had a doctor, his name was John Snow in London that wanted to track down cholera cases. Um, the, the doctor essentially started going through Soho and started looking and knocking on doors and kept on finding that the residents had left the neighborhood. So he had to work with a local expert, the Reverend Henry Whitehead to identify where people had lived beforehand before the cholera outbreak and essentially then make a map and identify where was the cluster of information to then point out that cholera was actually a disease that came about from a broken water pump that was connected to uh, um, uh, a broken water pump that was connected to a broken cistern. And so, you know, that was uh, well over a hundred years ago. And today we are still fighting that same battle the same battle of trying to figure out where is the information located, how do we get access to it, and then who are the people that know uh, most about that information, and how can we translate that to the general public. So Beta NYC as an organization uh, was started off as a meetup. Uh, we then formalized as a nonprofit after Hurricane Sandy when we realized that there was a huge opportunity to network the city's technology community. As part of that effort, we ended up writing this thing called the Digital Roadmap, the People's Roadmap to a Digital New York City, where we articulated a number of different policy proposals that end up driving our existence for the last six years. Primarily, we focus on uh, getting people access to information. We work with Gail's office and CUNY to provide a framework where kids can understand, kids, CUNY kids, they're not really kids, they're young adults, they're young professionals, uh, who are trying to understand how to use data and information to solve problems. Those CUNY undergraduate students then work with community board members to help build uh, a common understanding, a co common narrative around looking at 311 issues, looking at where are noise complaints that are coming from uh, before or after hours, so that way the Department of Buildings can then send out uh, um, inspectors to really take a look at what are the problems. One of, the, uh, uh, one of the other things that we work with Gail's office is taking a look at vulnerable religious facilities. So how do we go about finding and collecting the data to help understand and address community problems? When it comes to the digital divide, what we've looked at is um, really focusing on getting access to information, um, building lightweight tools to give you access to that information, building training, so that way you then know how to use the tools and you know the language around those, those things. And then advocating back into government so that way government has the capacity and the resources internally to essentially build the things that will help ultimately help bridge the digital divide. Thank you very much. Our next wonderful panelist is Clayton Banks. Clayton Banks is a CEO and co-founder of Silicon Harlem and Silicon Harlem, another organization for which I have great respect. And its goal is to combine technology and innovation with affordable connectivity that can enable a sustainable economic engine in communities that are emerging around the United States, although I'm focused on Harlem. I just do Manhattan, sorry, Clayton. Under his leadership, Silicon Harlem has attracted over $50 million into Upper Manhattan for advanced infrastructure research and test bedding. He has positioned Upper Manhattan as a tech and innovation hub, that is for sure. And it's one of the fastest growing areas for tech startups, entrepreneurs, and companies. He's been able to galvanize the public sector, the private sector, universities, and the community 
to embrace tech as a sustainable economic engine for Upper Manhattan. And before Silicon Harlem was there, that wasn't true. He has established critical programs that are based on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math in the schools and in nonprofits to prepare residents for the jobs of the 21st century. Prior to Silicon Harlem, Banks was a pioneer in the cable and communications industry. He set the vision for Ember Media, a development group that builds digital solutions and interactive applications for brands and nonprofit organizations. Known as a pragmatic visionary, he has developed and deployed leading edge technology and applications for network, cloud, gaming, social media, virtual reality, tablets, and so on. He worked with former president Bill Clinton to publish a first of its kind interactive college guide called The Key, and it's for underserved communities, and it features historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions. He served as vice president of affiliate relations for Comedy Central, that I didn't know about Clayton Banks. Um, he has been recognized with many awards and honors. Uh, I'm honored that he is our representative for Manhattan on something called COPIC, and he can tell us what that is in the public advocate's office. But he's been honored by many, many others. So without further ado, uh, thank you very much, Clayton, and please join us about the Dizzle Divide. Thank you, Gail. It's quite an honor, actually, to, one, be in a tall town hall with you, and two, all the <laughs> phenomenal panelists. Yes. One of the things I would... Um, sort of make clear. It's not just a digital divide. We know that's the subject today, but there's just really divides. Uh, if we only lean on the digital part of it, we may miss the entire idea of closing gaps. There's a wealth gap in this country. There's a health gap in this country. There's certainly education as a gap, homework gaps. There's a lot of gaps, not all due to digital. A lot of it is just a systemic, historic legacy that this country just has not addressed. The digital and the technology that has grown over the years certainly illuminates the idea of divides. And we've seen it pretty much all our lives. TV had a divide, cable had a divide, the internet had a divide, and now here, broadband connectivity has a divide. Those are very much clear, but here's what's the even scarier news. While we'll be talking about today, I'm thinking a lot about tomorrow. Yeah. And tomorrow, if there's one thing I'm certain of, if you look at your past, is that there's going to be another divide. And if we don't start to address that now, it's going to be our own fault. And when you say, Clayton, what's the next divide? Well, it's clear to me, having traveled all over the world, that countries and states and cities and villages and communities are preparing for a tech-enabled world. Everything becomes uh, tech-enabled, autonomous, virtual. This will create the next digital divide, if you will. And I want to prepare our communities here in New York City, and particularly in Upper Manhattan, to be prepared because most divides are defined by you know about it to know, know's point about information, or you can or cannot afford it. That's really been the, the real definition of these divides, particularly in the technology sector. So what I'm trying to focus on, Bruce and I both are figuring out how to ensure that we bring the information in, we bring in research, we leapfrog when it comes to technology, and make sure that a community is prepared for that next wave of technology and certainly not be caught in a divide. And again, with, with, with all of that, we still got to look at why are there no great, uh, why are there food deserts in low income areas that create sort of the health issues that we're talking about? Why are there not more, you know, opportunities for uh, tech companies and all that kind of stuff that starts to, you know, spread out through these uh, communities? There's a lot of other uh, symptoms that are creating um, sort of the device that we're talking about tonight. And I'll finally say, yes, we, if you looked at our history, Silicon Harlem, we've been talking about connectivity since 2013. Gail was with us from the very beginning. She's been preaching it forever too. And so for, for us, this is not new. It's not the pandemic 
that's going to make us all get connected. We should have been doing this a long time ago. And uh, to my fellow panelists, I would take it one step further. This is something that we have to work towards in terms of making connectivity almost uh, a utility. It's like water in your home. It's a civil right, more than a health right. So I hope we can get into some of those issues, but let's prepare ourselves for the future as much as we have to do what we have to do right now. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we could all have a discussion whether it's 18% or 29% do not have broadband internet access and you know the numbers are staggeringly high. So I, I wanna start with you, uh, Dr. Patton, because we have actually all 120 and growing people who are participating in tonight's panel, listening, and certainly hopefully they'll ask more questions, but a lot of them are already about young people. And so I know that's your unbelievably fabulous focus and your academic research. So I, my question is, you know, something that however you want to approach it, but certainly we want to understand how technology I, I want to make this positive. How can technology address some of the issues that we've all been arguing for for such a long time? Because we do have every one of those divides and more that were mentioned by Clayton. So is there something that we're looking toward that could help us in this recovery? Because I do a lot of Zooms and you do also. And I'm now focused as others are, what's next? As opposed to God knows we should be healthy and God knows the healthcare workers are uh, the folks we honor. But right now we got to think about the future. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up in the same health, same food, same digital that we've been in the past. So I'm just wondering if, you know, a lot of people are asking about this on the chat and certainly in advance. So it's all yours, Dr. Patton. Yeah, first, I think we really need to think through what are some strategies that we can enact right now. Number one, I really think that we need to prioritize the care of students. And it goes back to this idea that Clayton and others have been underscoring that there have been issues that have been longstanding within our education system, within our society that are just being amplified through this virus. But we need to prioritize the care of students, particularly as they move, move to remote learning. Number two is that we really have to create opportunities for project-based learning and enrichment that it's not about moving the school into the home because we know that that's not really a reality for a lot of the families and communities that we're talking about being able to say let's do algebra one in home today is not going to be a reality for a lot of our students so how can we really think about creating innovative experiences where young people can learn from in the home. What are some cultural enrichments? What are some things and experiences we can go back to that we have long forgotten that can still be an enriching experience for our students, but don't have to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with the exact thing that they're doing in the school. And then we just need to have some realistic um, expectations about uh, what students to do. Uh, can do during this time. And so I think, you know, some of the things we really have to think through are how do we partner with students? How do we um, center their voices in this experience? And we partner with their teachers and their parents and their administrators. Um, how do we continue to identify and support disadvantaged students? Here, I think there's an opportunity to really work with our social work partners um, that are in the school and within the community as well. We have a um, an array of social work um, institutions, in particular Columbia School of Social Work, where we can have digital social workers that are partnering with teachers in this moment to identify those really critical and cross-cutting needs for students that might be um, interfering with their ability to learn uh, during the day as well. Um, we also need to consider um, uh, emphasizing asynchronous learning um, um, in this space as well. Um, and then really trying to think through how do we um, strategically reduce some of the learning goals during the moment as well. How do we help students form student groups um, that can, so they can teach each other during this time? And how do we prioritize time for individual, um, individual students and really focus on plans for uh, remediation that will need to happen as a result of this as well? Okay. Um, Nilsa, obviously you're on the ground um, in East Harlem, not too far from the School of Social Work. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, uh, you're hardly a lay person like you say you are, but I'll, I'll let you get away with that for a little while. Um, but, the, but the question is, um, you know, without being um, 
you know, we can't solve all the problems, but I do think generally young people could find a way to make uh, what was just suggested by Dr. Patton something that's realistic. How can we make sure that policy exists if it should? What do you think? I think that in order to make policy, we need to have some concrete examples of how we can show that things are working, right? Because we all have different ideas, but then when we try to show them or we try to talk about them to have them um, adopted so that people can think about as policy. Um, if we don't have concrete examples, almost like a pilot, so to, as you will, it's very hard to get people to buy in uh, on certain things. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the state had a program, I'm not sure if they still do, it was called the PAVE program. And what that program did was it was um, a program that allowed students to come in at an after school, high school students, they could do work-related activities. They can do a research on a career, like let's say if it was a technical project, um, it could be something on the digital divide or anything like that. And it would give them college credit, it would give them high school credit and towards, um, towards college readiness preparation. Those are things that we need to look at. We need to look at how do we empower ourselves to work with partners such as Desmond and Clayton so that we can have a think group, a think tank, so you, as you will, so that the, the ideas that Desmond has mentioned and that Clayton I'm sure will expound upon, that we can then write, adopt, see how we can get a group of young people together to see how that would work. I think once we can, once we show that we have things that can actually lead to success, it'll be a lot easier to have buy-in both from government, from the city council, from not-for-profit partners. The government, DYCD is always funding not-for-profits to do the same kind of program all over again. Some of you, usually with the same providers, we can use those kinds of funding opportunities to target a specific not-for-profit with an idea of a program that fulfills what DYCD is looking, but goes even beyond that, that can prove what youth can do and how they can adapt to tech work, how they can adapt to using and to overcoming digital divides. Because if we don't have anything on the ground, we can just have ideas. And we can say, we think that, you know, East Harlem should have a thousand computers. Okay, now we have a thousand computers. What are, what are or laptops or tablets? How are they gonna be used? Well, they're gonna be used this way. And what is the outcomes? For instance, some of youth has been canceled. One of the ideas could be that if we're having kids work at home, that they may decide to be um, working with the census where they can do calls. They might be able to do training so that they can get a Microsoft certification depending on their age. Younger, younger youth can be using um, in the internet to do research and to do other things that will help um, expand and enhance what the community is looking for. Okay, Noel, I know you've been thinking about these issues also in terms of maybe uh, young people to me, could be high school, could be college. So. How do you think it's it's a broader issue just generally trying to figure out on um, this divide issue and it's like it's not just one kind of divide but if we can attack one divide maybe something else will go away i don't know but go ahead with what thoughts you might have about this yeah well um uh i think the the statement about inequality is is spot on and you know so many of us are fortunate enough to have the liberty and the opportunity to work on civic issues um, uh, and, you know, our, I'm pretty, I would love to know at one time period, any of us first talk to our uh, talk, first talk to an elected official, um, and something that we work with the Department of Education, uh, is empowering middle school and high school students to actually have those first meetings with their elected official. Um, we work with the Department of, uh, Education CS for All program to essentially grow, uh, an opportunity for students to use open data and to use computer science skills. Um, as part of an academic competition, so that way they can then go take that information that they're seeing of civic issues in their community and go speak directly to city council members. 
Um, if you go to our website, beta.nyc, and search for Hack League, um, you'll see the very first hackathon inside of City Hall, where we actually disturbed Corey Johnson while he was working because we got about 150 students to stomp their feet inside of the City Hall chambers to let everybody know inside of City Hall, the middle school and high school students were there to use their computer science principles to articulate their voice and to address issues like uh, the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria. They built an app um, that allows students in their neighborhood to essentially go collect Bitcoin, um, go collect trash. Uh, so, excuse me, they would go around their neighborhood, they would earn Bitcoin by collecting trash, and then they could then donate that uh, money to community groups that were part of the, uh, of the app. Or, um, you know, like uh, New York City is so diverse, the problems are really diverse. And so the number two team in the middle school um, was Oh Deer, which is to deal with uh, the deer population on Staten Island. And so it was an interactive app that could teach people essentially how to deer proof their trash and their sanitation issues. So that way it wouldn't cause a, a, the problem that they were seeing trash all around their, their neighborhoods. Um, and so as we see the addressing the digital divide, um, or as Clayton so eloquently pointed and everyone else did, is just the divide. Um, and that we need to really engineer a, a systematic uh, uh, government and education that helps bridge this divide. Uh, and it's not just information, but it's also just the tools. Like we need to be thinking differently about what are the tools and making sure that those tools are accessible to everybody. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I know Clayton, I mean, we all talk about access to the internet, you know, being part of the issue and tablets being part of the issue. It's bigger than that. I mean, that should be the basis. We're not even there yet. So I'm just wondering, how do we get, because you've been trying, how do we get to the first there with, you know, free internet, which is hard, and then tablets, some of the parents are writing in, how do we get tablets for all students? Now, certainly DOE, up to close to 300,000 trying to give out to young people. And I've been in all those discussions and they're certainly trying, I, I don't take that from them. But it's more than getting folks a tablet and more than getting folks uh, free uh, internet. So I'm just, how do you think we go beyond, even though we're not even there yet? That's the trouble, but I don't know how you can approach this. It's hard to think of how to get rid of this, all these divides. I'm not sure if in your, um, comments you're going to talk about this particular subject, but I do want to mention one thing on building on the, the student focus that we have right here. One of the issues that I find is that there's still a lot of teachers in the public school system that are also um, uncomfortable with remote teaching, for example, or um, not as savvy with technology as they ought to be. The kids have no problem. They're growing up in a digital world, so the, their adoption is very quick. Uh, the learning curve is very short, that's easy, but for some of the teachers in the public school system, I think, need attention. I remember, Gail, you and I talked about, you know, what we ended up doing was uh, getting part of the whole STEM Institute, and we were teaching teachers uh, around STEM and how to create curriculum and how to teach, and just about every program we've been involved in, whether it's working with the DOE or others, we've always asked to have a teacher in the classroom with us. And recently, we actually have been teaching in the projects. We actually go to the projects. Who does that, right? So we went to the projects to teach uh, on uh, various things, including uh, coding and stuff like that. So the point I'm making, though, is that the entire uh, solution has to include how we build out the teaching level, as well as administrators. There's still a lot of people, and you've been fighting this more than anyone, Gail, along with everyone else on this call, you know, to get broadband, you know, better broadband in schools, it's getting there to your point. But boy, is everyone getting the digital literacy. So we always talk about it as a, a three-legged stool. You need a device, you need the connection, the internet, and you need digital literacy. And that's across the board. Most of the people on this call probably uh, would be challenged to, to, to tell us what their speed is up and down right now. We don't all, but we all pay for it. So to your question of how do we make sure everyone has it? Well, I think a city like New York should make a commitment that not only every student will have a device every year that they're in schools, and I'm talking particularly public school, every single kid. And I think 
the way you do it is both public and private. I'm finding that there are a lot of the private sector, by the way, in the throes of this pandemic, there's one industry that has not suffered that much, and that's the tech companies, including Zoom, right? So the tech industry has been booming as a result of this pandemic because everyone's paying attention. So the private sector has a stake in making sure all these kids have the equipment and the access and the exposure. And I also think from a sustainable level, we've got to bring the economy to these low income areas. When, when California did their study about you know, broadband uh, penetration, they said, wow, low income areas have the highest level of, of not being connected. And my answer was, duh. So the point is, this is not a simply uh, I want or I don't want it. It's become a financial issue. It's hard to, uh, to have all of that in your home if you don't have the money for it. So we've got to lower that cost. The private sector has a stake in it. We have to get our city writing policy around. It has to be in the hands of every kid of every year uh, in their schooling. And that at the end of the day, we've got to lower the cost, if not make it free, for broadband across this beautiful city. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Patton, the, I mean, I'm a little jaded because as Clayton knows, I've been talking about this for a long time. So it, it gets me a little frustrated, to be honest with you. I feel like it's deja vu. We're getting baby steps. And so I don't know, uh, some of the questioners are saying, you know, why can't the companies like Verizon and others, you know, Spectrum and the big guys uh, participate, public private partnership, that too has some challenges because you always, uh, having testified at the FCC many times and dealt with some of the issues they want when they want to dig up the streets and they want, uh, you know, certain things and but they don't want to sort of help the city along, even though they're getting great access in terms of their cable or their wireless. So I get my question is, is there a public private partnership? We all want free broadband. I know that John Paul Farmer, who is the CTO, Chief Technology Officer now for the city and has uh, great credentials. He has the internet master plan, 88 pages. I've read most of it, but it's relying on open access fiber networks, um, ISPs, you know, again, I, again, I'm jaded because I did talk about this uh, 15 years ago and, you know, San Francisco didn't do it and Philadelphia didn't do it. And, you know, so then I'm like, how are we going to do it? And the kiosks don't do it. That's not going to work. So I'm jaded. And I think I need to listen to you to see how, given your research, is that what we're aiming for? You know, what are we aiming for, for the young people? And it's not just young people, it's families, it's small businesses. When I had a meeting recently, virtually, with all the business improvement districts, uh, managers, these are all across Manhattan, Upper Manhattan in particular, Washington Heights, was the only area where the small businesses had to be visited by the manager. Everywhere else you get on and you send out technology, email, text or something. Here, the manager of the bid had to find the person's phone number at home. And that's not easy when the bodega is closed. Yeah. That's how it had to communicate. So yeah. it's, when I talk about this issue of technology and families and students, I'm really talking about a broader uh, community. So I'm yeah. wondering if you could add to this, because we're, to be honest with you, I think we're kind of stumped on making yeah. it a reality. I mean, I don't know if I am, um, if I have a, a really different perspective than you do on this on this topic, but I, but I think that, you know, it should be expanded to public, private and everybody. Uh, yep. Because it, it's very clear to me that we, we we can't rely on solely on private relationships to make this happen. For mm -hmm. example, you know, one of the best opportunities that I've been able to engage in is that at Columbia Social Work, we created a, a virtual fellowship for formerly incarcerated citizens to get involved mm -hmm. in technology. And so we partnered with the Cold Cooperative to, to teach um, our fellows um, uh, coding and user research. And so when we needed to get laptops, we went to Cold Cooperative that went to their private relationships to be able to identify those laptops that we needed. But then as you have been hinting and underscoring is that that's not just the issue, right? And so we can get, we need the technology tools. We need the phones and the laptops. We need all those things, 
but there's also the environmental conditions in the home and the number of, of, of tools that are available that's also important. So what we know from the research is that, you know, young people do better when there are multiple platforms in the home. So if I only have my smartphone, whereas a young person from the Upper East Side has a smartphone, a VR headset and a laptop, well, they're gonna perform much, much better than the person who just has a smartphone at home. So we have to think about the multiplicity of tools that are available, but also do I have the environmental conditions that make it, um, conducive for me to learn in this environment as well. And that's where we really have to think about those community partnerships, those local leaders in the community that can work with families. This has to be, everybody has to be on board. This can't be technologists or private folks. We need the community leaders, we need the board leaders, we need everyone to help create environments and atmospheres that make it conducive for learning, period. So when you worked with this program that you just described for the uh, virtual and social workers and incarcerated, has it had any outcome yet or is it still uh, like a pilot and being worked on? Yeah, so this is our last week and it, it's been amazing to be able to run a virtual program during this pandemic. We've had a lot of challenges, um, but working with the Cold Cooperative, working with Get Out, Stay Out in East Harlem has been an amazing experience. So having the right people at the table has been um, extremely important. But I would say one of the mishaps that we didn't consider in the beginning was that, you know, when we switched to virtual, folks didn't have access to Wi-Fi. And so they were so excited to learn coding. They were so ready to go. And so we had to buy hotspots, but even buying the hotspots didn't mean that they were gonna show up the way that we wanted them to show up because of everything else that's going on. They're living their life, they're struggling, they're needing to get paychecks. And so we having to cover all those other contextual and community level factors all of that has to be in conversation with the amount of tools, the type of tools, access to Wi-Fi as well. We can't separate those pieces out. Uh, no, so a lot of people are asking about NYCHA, no surprise, and how uh, in East Harlem, as an example, how does NYCHA fit into this issue? It has the environmental issues that were just described. It has all of the divide issues that were just described. Ooh, and I, you know, I, I don't know how, if at all, looking at the digital divide can be bridged in some way in some kind of a pilot, as you suggested. But I, you know, maybe you could help us with what is needed. And again, a pilot might make sense, but NYCHA is a big challenge in terms of technology. So I grew up in NYCHA. Um, I'm a product of NYCHA, Lehman Village, um, and Johnson Houses. And so we had problems then, we have multiple more problems now. Our NYCHA population and our apartments in NYCHA, the housing stock has been woefully neglected. You all know by reading the newspapers when there, has been, there hasn't been water, there had no heat, no hot water, um, ceilings falling down and so, already nobody is thinking about divides at that moment they're thinking of survival right yeah. how do i how do i make sure that my asthma doesn't get more exacerbated because of the mold that's in the bathroom or how do i um make sure that my son doesn't get mugged as he goes down the stairs because the doors are kept open and people just come in right so I can go on about NYCHA. NYCHA, as horrible as it sounds, has a wealth of people who want to do better and want their kids to do better and want themselves to do better. And so when people talk about NYCHA, they have a view of a certain population. And I'm here to tell you that that is not so. We have hardworking parents in NYCHA who work, who pay high rents, just, to, just in order to hold a roof over their head. So what does NYCHA mean? NYCHA means schools that are responsive to NYCHA residents. And what I mean by that, there are a lot of, a lot of young people who have not been tested for learning disabilities. And they get into school and they try to keep up and they can't keep up and they're labeled as unable to learn or depending on how graphic you wanna be, some people call them stupid. 
They don't take into account that a child may have a language barrier because he comes from Spanish parents who only speak Spanish and he's learning English. So what are the things we need to do? We need to try to assess, get more social workers in the schools so or students that can come in from social work programs to actually work with the teachers to try to do honest day-to-day -day assessments. Not, it's not always the technical assessment that can lead you down a certain road. Sometimes it's just observation. How do we open up technolo technology and digital learning to parents who only speak Spanish? We need to start doing things that are teaching that is based on the home language so that the young person can learn not only in their language, but the parents are also empowered to learn. We need those laptops in NYCHA. We need to assess that what are the tools that are needed so that kids learn. We also need to know about the stressors in their life. It, you know, it's not just one thing, but I think um, I also directed another program called the Escalera program, and it was through the National Council of La Raza at that time. Now it's called Unidos US, the organization. And what they did was they sponsored 15 young people in the community. They started with 15. And these young people could be immigrants. More than likely, their parents could have been undocumented. And what these students did was they tried to learn. Um, they, it was an after school program. They did a project. They got laptops. They got, um, I think, cameras, digital cameras, so that they can learn how to do digital um, photography and learn how to use a digital camera. They got laptops, they, and they also got a stipend. Well, I challenge something like that to be thought of maybe on a smaller scale with multiple partners, with, with the expertise of someone like Desmond, with the expertise of someone like Clayton, and with funding, targeted funding in one of potentially one of our quote unquote worst developments to try to weed out young people that may have um, background in, in, you know, they may have some kind of legal um, challenge. So should it, we shouldn't look at the cream of the crop. We should look across the board to try to stagger who we can assist. And I think if we can do something like that, so that we empower NYCHA residents and NYCHA students so that they feel they are so much more than people think they are. And with that comes other training, teaching our kids that they can be in the boardroom and they can speak up and that they represent because the truth is, if our kids don't talk, start taking the lead, people, other people that don't know their challenges will be the leaders that will step up. And this will continue to perpetuate. It will not get better. Well, I mean, that's a, a wonderful segue because um, lots of questions are coming in. Should everybody have a laptop? Yes. Should everybody have a computer? Yes. And, you know, but you get back to this environment issue. It's a package of challenges. So I want to know, uh, know the issue of data. But of course, um, you know a lot more about than I do, although I feel very strongly um, and from a public policy perspective. So. It, there is a lot of discussion, given this uh, COVID, about data. Um, how many people in the hospital today? How many people, may they rest in peace, died today? How many people have the disease? How many people are asymptomatic? How many healthcare workers? How many grocery workers? It, it, the list is endless. How many people are not distancing, social distance? How many people are at home? How many seniors don't have food? That's what I've been working on. Um, how many, and the list goes on, data, data, data. And you hear elected officials state, I'm listening or not, depending, to the scientists, right? And the scientists equal data. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing if we're using the data and using it correctly. And there are next step testing, how many tests, this kind of test, that kind of test, where are the tests? And now, of course, do we need detectives to go find those of us who have had the disease and recovered? And where are we? And maybe we still have it or we got it. And whose friends have we, you know, you got the picture. 
Massachusetts has already hired folks, the governor and the mayor. I'm quite, not quite sure who's hiring what, but they're both stating they're hiring uh, folks who figure this out. So uh, whether it's Bloomberg paying for it, the city's paying for it, I don't know. But there are certainly discussions along those lines and there are uh, places where you can apply for these jobs. So my question to you as a data person, um, picking up on what Nilsa has stated and Dr. Patton, where they're, you know, these challenges are so huge. Is there a data solution? In other words, we have the device, pretend. We have, hopefully, some kind of uh, free Wi-Fi, broadband access. I could go, that's what I could go on and on about, but I'm not going to right now, lack of. And then how does the data play a role? Um, I know that California is also looking at some of these data issues and how it can be used to make us healthy, but at the same time, please, can they also solve some of these divide issues? Well, that's my question. It's a big one, but I know uh, you have a lot of experience with the data. Thank you. Um, I Sometimes I, I don't know where to begin with all of the great questions. Um, uh, I will say that, you know, broadly speaking, when it comes to um, data in general, uh, data is a form of, of language. Um, and we all learn language um, uh, through a very intensive process, right? Uh, you know, nobody, nobody is, is shot out um, and, and you come out into this world and you know how to speak. You, you acquire the ability to communicate over time and you're constantly revising those methods of communication time and time again. And we have uh, verbal feedback, we have visual feedback sometimes um, that is interpreted um, body language. So um, uh, the ability to communicate is fundamentally data that we're gathering. Um, and we develop a literacy uh, around these things. Um, and we grow that level of literacy over time. The, the same thing goes for essentially translating that into a, a, um, a data literacy. Um, but when you come to a data literacy, something that we've seen is that you have to understand many other layers. Not only is it just about the tactics and, and the language of the data, um, but it, it's also like how you're pulling apart how an agency describes their particular operations. So you now have to know a function and you have to know a language and then you have to know the tool and then you have to have the right set of tools. Um, and so um, these are all complicated uh, uh, layers and complicated problems um, that fundamentally need to be baked into our educational system and need to be baked into literacy programs uh, at the at the earliest level and all the way to the to the oldest level. They need to be baked into. Um, the, actually, I will say this. In another way, is that the le the classes and the way to create literacy needs to be organized around how someone learns. And so Nilsa brought up. Um, people who have, uh, who learn differently. I learn differently. Uh, throughout my, and 12 years of growing up, I was a quote unquote special needs uh, child because um, of my attention deficit issues, as well as my ability to um, somehow improperly communicate uh, to my uh, in instructors. Um, they wanted me to run through a very rigorous formulaic process that my brain just didn't quite understand. Um, and so we need to understand that n not everyone learns in the same way and not everyone has the same level of language and capacity. And we need to invest in, in ways to bring up people's literacy. You know, we did this with reading and writing in the 20th century where we brought nearly uh, everyone up to uh, a, a comprehensive level of being able to read and write. You know, we, we, we systematically tackled poverty uh, um, in these uh, great society programs, which, which put reading and writing at its foundation. Um, we need to do the same thing in uh, the 21st century, but to do so means that we have to in invest in our education system and we have to invest in job training mm -hmm. systems. Um, and those are things that, as you can see in the types of economic crises that we've had, not just are having, but that we've had, we systematically underfund 
Um, and the, those who are at the top keep on getting wealthier and those at the bottom keep on struggling to survive. So, you know, we need to create uh, literacy that is accessible to everyone, which fundamentally means we have to create a broad set of literacy. I know, um, Clayton, you have worked in a sense in this digital literacy world, because when I think of it and I think of the divide and it's a broader divide as you keep stating, but you've worked with the seniors and in Harlem, particularly elsewhere also, that's a big divide for the seniors to understand digital literacy and of course, uh, young people and the, and the language issues, which Noel has eloquently described. So and, uh, I'm just wondering what resources are there for New Yorkers, whether you're in NYCHA or not or anywhere to bridge this skill gap? And then the most challenging question, which I wouldn't have two months ago asked is, uh, how do we approach this issue in the current world of social distancing? When I am on the phone with different um, city officials or more importantly, the private sector people, restaurants, bars, uh, et cetera, all they think about is what is the world gonna look like with social distancing and everything else that's going on? So how will this world, you know, in social distancing and trying to get the, the divide, I'll just leave it at that, uh, addressed? I mean, that's a hard question, but maybe you thought about it for the future. I, well, I think about it all the time. I, um, I believe that we're gonna be moving into what we call a new normal. And that new normal will look like a hybrid between remote and physical. And we will have a whole new way of looking at things like take your shoes off when you come into my home. <laughs> you know? So I always thought that was silly, but now I understand it. Um, so there will be a new normal. I wanna talk about uh, this question, but I wanna quickly just do a nod to data that Noel talked about. One thing I wanna demystify around data. Data is for me more of a compass than driven. Right, people talk about data driven, data driven, data driven. I don't think it drives. I think it's more of a compass. We still have to bring humanity to data. Data said economy works when you have slaves, but somebody had to say, wait a minute, something's wrong with having slaves. <laughs> so we have to look at data as a compass that might point us a direction, but we still have to add humanity to all of this. And we um, often talk about advancing humanity as you look at this pandemic it's actually challenging each of us individually to figure out how do we bring equity to all zip codes so to your point we always are looking at how to demystify technology if you remember gail when we were at saint nicholas houses and we had that one meeting uh and when the questions came up the first question from one of the nights of residents was hey mr banks um how come my intercom doesn't work now we weren't there to talk about intercoms at all but that came up because there was a safety issue. You know, I can't see my mom or all these type of things. And so that's when it hit me that this still comes down to people. That's what Nelson so was know, saying. Yeah. You know, and, and I believe, and I said it on January 23rd in a big meetup at our office that uh, within the next few years, we, everyone will be connected and will be able to afford it if it's not 100% free. If you look at New York City, Gail, to your point of why we don't, why it's been so frustrating for you and for me and others. We now have the infrastructure to do this, to, to, to make this actually happen. If you look how fast Intersection and Link NYC deployed an entire network, we, you know, it, and certainly it's not as comprehensive as it needs to be, but as you see how quickly that happened, this is now the moment where we can do this for the entire city, especially for uh, those areas that are, are, are most at risk. And so I believe the connectivity piece will be sort of out of the way, and then it becomes, how do we use that to create the literacy that leads to good jobs or a good college or other uh, trainings and certifications? We, Silicon Harlem, know this works, Nilsa, because we went into East Harlem. We were challenged to build out what we call a resilient wireless network we worked with all of the businesses in and around um, the East Harlem area, and we hired kids out of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. trained them for several months on how to become basically network deployment engineers, and we built the very first resilient network in East Harlem. Because when Hurricane Sandy 
hit, it it obviously flooded over as the East River flooded over it as as uh, East Harlem is sort of a floodplain. So we were able to build that out. So these are not things where we're waiting for somebody to come. These are things that we know how to do. And frankly, we'll be doing more of that throughout the city, almost looking like an ISP, if you will, because broadband, the expense of it is ultimately in the capital up front. After that, it's relatively free. The incumbents can do it right now, but they obviously are on the hook for video. We don't have that anymore. And so yep. the point I'm making is we will solve the connectivity piece. We will work on the device piece and we will have people with digital literacy that lend, uh, leads into a job and a career. And there will be people out of NYCHA and people out of other areas of the city that will become, you know, uh, part of the, e of the economic uh, growth that this city has well in front of it. And it will be based a lot in the ability to have that level of literacy around technology, but we need to demystify it. It has to be humanized. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, it's for everybody. So I've seen senior citizens, Gail, let me end with this since you talked about this and you've been at our senior center meetups. Mm -hmm. The senior citizen, the very first year, everybody on this call, we did it in 2016. Our very first year, we did a demystified technology for seniors. And the first question I had was, Mr. Banks, um, I heard you talk about social media and I just want to know why do people want to be my friend? I really got that question and we all sort of laughed, but we all sort of asked that question at the very beginning. And then last year I did the same thing. This is four or five straight years we've been doing it. And a hand went up and a lady says, Hey, I was walking through the store the other day and I had my smartphone and all of a sudden I got this notification on my phone, Mr. Mason. I just went and how, and I almost fell off my chair. The literacy can be done, no matter how old you are or how old young you are. The critical piece here is giving everybody that access, and we can get that done. And we can hire people right out of the night to uh, housing everywhere. Well, that's all right. I agree with you. We're going to make sure that happens. Lane. We're up to 250 viewers, which is a lot. Congratulations. And I just want to mention... Uh, there's another group called Digital Divide Partners, Stuart Reed, and they too have been working in NYCHA. So there are a lot of people uh, attempting. We're, we're slowly getting there. And I think with this kind of discussion, and I have to say there might be a small silver lining in this God awful virus in terms of what we have learned. So uh, Dr. Patton, I have a lot of people are asking, you know, this is kind of a, a challenging question, but um, what is the world going to look like, you know, post COVID? We've kind of been talking about that. Obviously, you should feel free to talk about the community where you've done your research, and we have been discussing it. But they they worry, you know, how many people have died because of poverty, and then is there some role? We talked a little bit in terms of health conditions. Is there some role, mental health or physical health? Can it be changed in terms of? who accesses it. So we have less deaths, not just because of COVID, but we all know all about these underlying conditions. So I guess I'm, you know, you're working with populations that definitely have all kinds of underlying conditions. And I'm wondering if there is any role for technology in that group and if it might play a role in terms of our future. It's hard to know. Well, you know, for me, I think that whatever technology we leverage in this time and in the future first has to center and prioritize and privilege the experiences of the most vulnerable. And when I mean vulnerable, I mean those who are visibly and invisibly vulnerable as well. I think that the technology has to be co-created and co-developed with the community as well. And so as we've been talking about, there are all of these important critical social needs that have to be at the forefront of whatever comes out of these experiences. And yet I am so very hopeful because we're having this conversation now, we're gonna go back to our respective communities, we're gonna figure out ways to partner. I'm hopeful that we're going to begin to really center these conversations because if this virus hasn't done anything, what it has done is hyper visibly underscore the inequality in our country. Yes. And we cannot turn back. <laughs> and so I, I hope that we see this as an opportunity to do so much better. Um, what I've learned from young people is that 
they are so very excited about what technology offers in terms of career opportunities. It was, there was no challenge in being able to start this new fellowship with formerly incarcerated citizens. These are all young people that have just come home. Um, they were so very excited to learn coding. They were so very excited, most importantly, to offer their expertise as a way to develop new technologies and to critique and critically analyze technologies. For example, if we think about contact tracing, let's have partnerships with NYCHA and other community members to think about what are the best ways to, to do contact tracing? Should we use apps or should we use more analog methods? And we have to be in conversation with those community members before we move forward with the best approaches. It makes sense to me. Well, um, do you think that, you know, they're, ooh, I mean, Massachusetts is doing something, California is doing something, as I understand it. You may have more information than I do. I've only read about it in the press in terms of some kind of contact tracing. And I talked to a California organization today. Um, they are taking, they have all the data not as much as Noel does, because nobody has as much as Noel, but they have done the overlays that are needed. How many people in the hospital, again, making sure HIPAA is uh, abided, not broken in terms of its uh, very necessary privacy issues. How many people on my block? How many people here and there? How many cars? You know, all the kinds of data that New York City's and then the issue is, I guess California is doing some of this according to 60 Minutes. I didn't see the show, but people called me and told me. And then the notion is, you know, we are all social distancing over here. We're not sick. Folks over here are not. They are sick. Let's, we're not talking about arresting anybody or sending in NYPD. We're talking about figuring out how we can work together as a community to try to address why there isn't social distancing you know, but you don't need to waste your time over at Johnson houses because it's only Wagner houses or whatever. So um, that kind of discussion, is that something that you can see happening as long as it has uh, input from the communities involved? Absolutely. And I think that one of the things we need to consider is, you know, I, I've been in a lot of conversations around the ethics of contact tracing. And so there's a lot of concern around the use of technology in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but what I, I think that there's an opportunity to think about contact tracing is also an opportunity to think about con uh, tracing the needs of hard to reach communities, right? And so we've been talking about lack of access to, to technologies and tools. And so who might be missed? Whose voices might be absent if we solely rely on an app-based or technology-based uh, uh, contact tracing methodology. And so I think that there would need to be some mirroring of uh, methods that definitely prioritize those hard to reach voices that may not have access to these technologies. Yeah, I mean, it's all coming at one time. You have the census, which we haven't discussed and it makes me crazy that Manhattan is behind Staten Island. I'm beside myself, but we're working on that. We want to beat Staten Island, not to mention beat the rest of the country in our percentage. But we have the that issue. I don't really know even what contact tracing is except what I read about in the papers. It's a, it, it's a, it's a strange bird um, that we've never experienced before. So what exactly is it? You did a good job uh, describing it and indicating who should be involved to make it work. Um, I was interested that when, and I hope I have this right, I think the governor's people were doing testing at Washington houses. And when they did that, they did, okay, we're testing you for the virus, but do you have anything else that we could address, right? That's what I think you're sort of saying is that we need to look more holistically at all of us as opposed to just one portion. And Nilsa, you've certainly got a lot of experience with this. I don't know what it looks like post COVID, but the issue is, you know, I don't even know there is such a thing, but do you think that there is some way in which we can approach working with people either for contact tracing, um, figuring out if there are other ways that we do business either at the community board or elsewhere. I'm sure you've been thinking about that. Well, there has to be a way. This, we're not gonna, this is not gonna disappear. This has, this is um, an illness 
that has decimated our communities, that has awoken our communities to disparities. So there has to be ways to bring in the community to come in to, for instance, you, you mentioned contract, contact tracing. I think that our community would be more comfortable talking to people that they know from their communities or that have a, a, a shared common experience. If this is the same issue with the census. Why is Manhattan or East Harlem answering census less than other communities? Because we have undocumented individuals who don't understand what the sense, the point of the census, and are afraid that this is another governmental um, plan to try to find them, arrest them, and deport them, right? So the way with what I'm saying with all that, there is a way we can try to start thinking and planning about how contact tracing will look in our community, what funding is available out there, and how we can create programs through other not-for-profits or through ourselves, having people come in, going through some kind of a process to ensure that they do training, that they understand about privacy, what the purpose of the contact tracing is, and to find out that they're actually, that the contact tracing would be effective. Because, you know, you can have one person try to find out where this person was and five other people, but if you don't know how to talk to people and get the information in a non-threatening way so that it's usable, you're not going to succeed. So we would need a lot of components to put together, which would be training, recruitment, um, support from area not-for-profits and other agencies in order to build a good pilot to start um, somewhere uh, identifiable, like potentially one NYCHA project. Right. No, you must have written this or you were channeling the person who did, because what they asked is parents need to know if our kids can participate in some kind of a hackathon to help young people uh, engage with their digital communities. Young people could create apps to help address COVID-19. That's certainly right up your alley. And it is something that I know you've been doing it. So why don't you talk about it when you're going to do it again, if you can do it again. And then it, you know, now I teach at Hunter once day a week. Oh my gosh, you know, these young people got kicked out of their dorms when uh, they were needed for the healthcare workers. Then they had no place to go because their parents are not in the city. Um, they had a grandfather who moved in, who's got the virus. Uh, they had, another one has a mother who's never, I mean, you're talking about teachers. This, this wonderful teacher, she teaches special education. She had never done the tech training of anything. So here is the student who's both working part-time, going to school, there's other children in the household, and he's teaching his mother how to do Zoom, Microsoft Team, and the list goes on. I mean, it was a story made for uh, television, and et cetera. So these students, um, what I'm trying to say is they know the issues regarding COVID-19 in too many different ways. But I'm just wondering if you're thinking about doing something that is along the lines that you've done in the past with the hackathons on this topic. Yeah, hackathons are great ways to uh, kind of bridge the digital divide in the sense that it gives you an opportunity to, to learn and experiment. They're safe places for uh, subject matter experts and individuals to come in and kind of like work through an idea. And so um, what I mentioned beforehand was Hack League which is a program of the Department of Education CS for All program. Um, it's an academic competition where middle school and high school students uh, learn from their teachers whom we've trained on how to access open data. Um, then they go through a process of working with subject matter experts because um, you know, while you can build, this is kind of the hubris of technology, while you can pretty much build anything, the question is, are you building the right thing um, and so while you may have <laughs> scratching your own itch uh, and kind of like addressing your problem, the question is, is it, is it like the universal problem, um, which is where you need to be talking to other people. You need to be talking to your neighbors. You need to validate your idea. You need to be talking to your friends. You need to be kind of getting out of your bubble and getting out of your comfort zone and making sure that you're really kind of finding all of the different facets that are around it. 
what are the privacy impl implications of of the game that you're making? Uh, what is you know what is the security aspect if you have some type of dashboard for people to kind of share their information? Um, and so um, we do this in a very structured way with the Department of Education in a very diverse uh, group. Um, the DOE focuses on making sure that we have diverse representation from all five boroughs. Um, and so. Um, right now, we concluded our five borough hackathons, and so we were going to have the final uh, inside of City Hall, our second final inside of City Hall on April 3rd, uh, but that has uh, so far been delayed, so we will reconvene our quote-unquote final um, once we're able to all get in the same space together. In the meantime, we're pivoting to do a virtual hackathon um, and have an opportunity for the students to engage um, over a, a, a series of months because now that we've moved into a virtual way, um, you have to figure out like things are a little bit slower. Uh, you know, we have to align subject matter experts and find right size them so that way the students can get the right perspective. Um, so the Hack League uh, continues, it's moving digitally. Uh, we hope that the DOE continues to get funding for the CS for All program so that way it can continue uh, next year and we'll, CS for All will have the fourth Hack League. Um, that, that is all of our aspirations from the city budget side of things. Um, but if you are interested in learning the exact same thing that our teachers, uh, our Department of Education teachers have had access to, um, or what community board members have access to, um, you can go to our website, beta.nyc and forward slash classes, uh, and you can get access to the same teaching materials. Um, so that way you can start to learn about New York City open data, see how the data relates to your particular problem. Um, sad, uh, sadly, COVID data is not on the open data portal. The Ooh. Department of Health doesn't share the data on the open data portal. We hope that that is going to be addressed shortly. Um, we are going to be sending a, lay, a letter, an additional letter to some elected officials encouraging them to get the data on the open data portal. In the meantime, you can get COVID data from the Department of Health's website. Um, you will have to learn a few more tools. Uh, it, it isn't as easy as just getting onto the Socrata open data portal uh, and downloading the data, um, but it's up there. At least portions of it are. Um, and, and then you can start to look at how your community is impacted by COVID. Um, there's a lot of other data sets that are on the open data portal. Sorry to be a little long-winded, but this is my opportunity to talk about the open data portal. So there are a lot of data sets that are on the open data portal that show you the impact of, uh, um, of, of COVID, like from sanitation tonnage to 311 service requests to, um, you can see how this, how this virus is impacting all of our communities uh, on the open data portal on nyc.gov forward slash data. Um, you can access curriculum um, on the own, uh, nyc uh, forward slash, nyc.gov forward slash data uh, classes which is our material. Um, and then in the fall, we'll be looking at um, how we can leverage our community and our events um, to kind of talk about these future issues. Um, but that's where you can see the data and maybe you can do your own hackathon at home um, to learn how COVID is impacting your, your neighborhood. I mean, I think people would love to do that. So it's a very helpful uh, analysis of data and we will work on getting it onto the portal. Clayton, I know that um, I'm certainly not an artist. You have a little comedy artist in your background, I noticed. But um, people are asking about artists because during this situation, this crisis, they are struggling. And we have been, as you know, uh, speaking with Vosa Rivers, artists in Harlem, artists in Upper Manhattan about their future, their artist community which many young people, whether they know it or not, are part of in different ways, um, is struggling. I mean, mostly artists rely on one kind of a box office or, or not. There's no third party reimbursement for an artist. So actually recently when we were on a, a call, um, 
the issue of what can we do for artists, somebody suggested even something like a gift card so that, you know, we have gift cards for, um, certainly for restaurants, for instance, we have to think more creatively. And I don't know if there's anything. It is very interesting to me how the artist community without getting paid for it, that's the problem. There's no paywall here usually, has the dance and the art and the theater and many other opportunities, uh, tours of, of museums and so on. And it's exciting. I mean, there's some really talented uh, visuals going on. But I guess what I'm saying to you is in this future, um, do you see if there's anything else you can think of where technology could help some of these struggling artists in the future? So it's a hard question. I don't, I don't have an answer, but I think it's something we need to think about. Well, it is. And there's some ideas that I do have from a tech perspective that I'm, I'm uh, getting more and more access. And of course I serve on uh, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. So I work with Boza all the time. And one of the things that we're seeing in the tech industry is the growth of what we call XR. Because I think if there's one thing that can, one additional thing that can come out of the pandemic is that we have to become, we have to ex exercise our creativity. You know, so as, as things look dim and, and all this other stuff, this is when creatives really come to light. So one way they can start to make money is to adapt some of their creativity into a, if you will, uh, VR, XR environment where you can literally stream a movie in that environment and have people pay to be a part of that experience. So I want to encourage the uh, creatives out there on this call and others um, that are that are driven by arts and culture is to become creative. You can have a play in a virtual world, if you will. And I'm not saying everything goes virtual, but I am saying that that's a new platform that creates another divide where if you can afford uh, the equipment and you know about it, you can take advantage of it and make money in it. And I think there's a lot of, of our arts and culture folks that just simply, and, and by the way, the technology is not all that exciting until the arts and uh, culture people yeah. get in it. So we techies, we love the equipment. We love writing the code. We love doing all this techie stuff that doesn't do anything. But it's not until somebody creative and goes, wow, let's do a Pokemon game. And all of a sudden, all the technology takes off. Silicon Harlem was working on AR, as you know, Gail, for many, many years. And it wasn't until Pokemon that it actually got a little shine. So the arts and culture will survive. They've got to get past this area of, of, of a sort of a ditch. But I, they will survive, one, if they stay up on the technology, work with the techies like myself to figure out best ways to get their art out there. The idea of theaters, uh, playhouses, those things that are going to be um, reimagined as we think about uh, what I call physical distance. I don't know why we call it social distance, but physical distance. Um, and so we're going to have to retrofit some of those theaters to accommodate that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to creativity. Our young people need to grow up with, I, you know, my first uh, Broadway play was The Wiz, and it changed my entire life, if you will. I thought, wow, this is what I'm all about. Of course, I'm much more techy, but I love the fact that I could see a live performance. That can still happen. So I would not be discouraged. They got to get past this one. And we all, as you say every day, Gail, we all have to support the arts and culture. So whether it's given money, whether it's given them some, some um, encouragement, this is an era where creativity will explode. Well, thank you, because I, I need to hear that because I worry about the artists constantly. So that's very helpful. And it has been helpful to see them trying to come up with some of these ideas that you've just outlined. The issue is how do you get paid for it? And that's to be, to be decided, to be... You know, TBA, as we say. If you look at, well, Gail, if you look at gaming, yes. you, you heard about the gaming Fortnite. Yep, yep. The, one of the top Fortnite players makes $500,000 a month, okay? Yeah. And the reason why is because what's beautiful about Switch, the platform Switch where we play Fortnite, yep. you literally have an audience watching you, and they're yep. paying. They're actually donating. They raise more money on that platform than than Facebook. So you're looking at 
um, a whole new way. The, the, the arts and, and the folks that we know need to get a, get a connect with me and let's get them moving. We yeah. will work on that for sure. Um, I, uh, Dr. Patton, the issue of mental health comes up all the time. Um, it's, uh, you know, luckily I think in our city, it hopefully become less of a stigma, who knows? I think obviously after this pandemic it's even worse. I don't know if there's a technology portion to it. I know that people are in their home. I know there are mental health concerns, there are DV concerns. Um, there's telemedicine. I don't know if there's telesocial work. There should be. I, you know, as others know, all I do is say social workers are needed in the schools. I've been saying that for years. That's, you know, you get one or two and then you get a press conference. That's not what I'm talking about. But right now we're dealing with the aftermath, I assume. Yep. And so I'm just wondering, how do you look at this issue? I, I don't know quite how to approach it, except thank God for your profession. And I'm just wondering if there's uh, something that you could add to all of that, because it's a, it's a huge challenge. Yeah, so two things. Number one, I'm a social media researcher. And one of the things I learned from my social media analysis is about all the complex trauma and needs and concerns that our community has has but may not have an individual to um, speak to with about those challenges but they're willing to express those things on a social media platform because it's a unadulterated space and so we're willing to think about what social media has to offer in terms of a mental health intervention that can be useful but at the columbia school of social work we have created COVID 19 action this is a action group filled with alums faculty and staff and we are offering free psychoeducation training and volunteer matching opportunities. So we will have a set of psychoeducation uh, training starting tomorrow night where you can mm -hmm. learn more about um, therapeutic, therapeutic interventions, um, train the trainer models, one about stigma, one about race and oppression in this, um, during this time. But also we are linking our clinicians with communities and organizations that need support during this time. And so our, if they are, um, community groups, individuals that are looking for support in, in this very urgent time, please contact us and I can share that website with you as well. Yeah, and I know that there is a website, um, the one that was uh, will be given at the end, I'm just looking for it, but I'll find it. And that one is one that uh, Columbia University as a whole part of their neighborhood program. And I'm sure that's one place to uh, support, but I, I'm also sure that uh, Nilsa is taking down notes because she would yes, be- Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I know. So how could that be helpful to the community in East Harlem, Nilsa? Well, we can always use as many sources as possible. But what's most important is that we have to be aware of the resources. If we're not aware of the resources, we can't post them on our website. We can't use word of mouth to let people know resources are key right now i i you know it's some people say it's great that you're at home you know your social distancing that word as opposed to physical distancing as clayton has mentioned and you should be fine you no know, you've seen um domestic violence go up you've seen so many challenges happening so how can that help east harlem it doesn't only have to have to help the east harlem it has to help all of us right so all the resources that we would get here, we will pass it on to our other 11 sister brother community boards so that they can get the word out. And it continues exponentially because every resource is only as good as the access that people use, right? So anything that we can get, as I said, I'm also the director of a multi-service center, which has 12 not-for-profits. Any resources that one person gets, another person gets, another group. So it's vitally important that any resources that anyone has that's not mentioned here that you know can help just one person, that you please share it on this chat so that we can all make it available on our different platforms. Okay. We have 320 people participating, which is a huge number. So Congratulations to great panelists. And um, the website that will have not only bridging, bridging, uh, bridging the Digital Divide, our town hall, 
but it's also neighbors.columbia.edu. And I'll have both this material and of course, whatever you mentioned, Dr. Patton, that you're doing at the Columbia University uh, School of Social Work. So it's my understanding that we have to uh, start to wrap up. Um, it's eight o'clock, but I, I wanna uh, say that uh, each and every one of you, I hope I've answered some of the questions. Uh, I am excited about the fact that there's a lot of op optimism about what we can do uh, in terms of the, I guess call a digital divide, even though there are so many other divides and you can't deal with the digital divide until you've dealt with all the environmental issues that go with it. So I've always said, never use technology for technology's sake, use technology to address some of the issues that you all have listed. And I, it's very exciting what different people are doing. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Desmond Patton. I want to thank uh, Nils Orama. I want to thank Noel Hildago. I want to thank Clayton Banks. And I certainly want to thank uh, Columbia University. And I, I want people to remember that um, we had a digital divide before uh, the pandemic, and we certainly will have one afterwards, but I hope that we use this opportunity to address some of the underlying issues that have always been with us. It's, it's racism, it's poverty, it's health uh, underlying conditions. It's, uh, you know, it's the broad lack of free Wi-Fi. If you are speaking at a high school and uh, I go to the high schools and now I've learned, my first question is who would like free Wi-Fi and everybody's hand goes up. If you ask something more generic, you get everybody looking at you like, please, Gail Brewer, can you leave as soon as possible? But once you get a discussion going that is relevant to them, something that people need at their age, then you have a different discussion. So as you know, I'm a big fan of finding a way that civic technology in its best sense means something to those of us in communities where it's needed the most. So um, I thank you all for participating in our virtual town hall, Bridging the Digital Divide during COVID-19. There'll never be another time like this, I hope. Uh, and I hope we can learn from it. So thank you all very much. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Gail.